Om Sam Saraswati Namaha Namaste. Uh, we're on page 127 and we just left off with verse number 26. And if you remember, the king, uh, Surat, the conveyor of good thoughts, uh, he, he lost his kingdom and he fled to the forest uh, on the pretext of hunting and then uh, he ended up in the ashram of the intellect of love and he started wandering around the ashram and he met this businessman named Samadhi who had lost his Samadhi. And now he too has wandered into the ashram uh, without his Samadhi and the businessman said, my name is Samadhi and I'm a businessman born in the lineage of those who worship infinite energy, the Divine Mother herself. And he was cast out by his wife and his children, all the thoughts that were born from that pure intuitive perception. He started to perceive thoughts instead of pure infinite perception. And when he started to make differences and distinctions and individualizations, then suddenly he lost his samadhi. And he said, I've been deprived uh, of my wealth and my wife and, and sons have seized my estate. All the wealth of pure consciousness dissolved when he started thinking about this and that and the other thing. And now he's come into the forest and he's thinking about his family. Are they happy now that they've taken all my wealth? <laughs> Did that make them happy or are they unhappy? And staying here, I'm unaware of the activities of my family. Do they experience tranquility at present or discomfort? Rain? Are my sons observing good conduct or are they behaving with evil and wickedness? And that's where we left off last night. It was a very good question because, hey, are those thoughts behaving themselves? <laughs> or are they, are they good thoughts? I think if they were good thoughts, they would have gone to Surat's kingdom, to the kingdom of good thoughts. So I, I don't know what their status is. And then the king and the businessman, they said to each other, isn't it strange that this ashram is such a beautiful place of refuge? The fruits are so sweet. The food is delicious. There is nothing lacking here. Why are our minds thinking about all the stuff we left behind? Why can't we make our minds sit still in the present reality? Why are we clinging to the attachments of the past? The king is thinking about his elephant and about his kingdom and his ministers and all his wealth. And Samadhi is thinking about his children and all those thoughts that are going on in the minds of all the seekers. And he is wondering if they're happy now that they've stolen all his wealth and thrown him out. And the king said, this is verse number 26, you have been cast out by your wife and children because of their avarice and greed. Why are your thoughts so bound in love for them? What's this attachment? Why are you attached to them? You still love them even though they threw you out. They stole your wealth. They stole your peace. They put you out. Here you are in the ashram of the rishis. Why are you thinking about them with such love? And the businessman said, just as you were speaking to me, I was having the same thought. Hey, what is this? Why am I so enamored of them? But what can I do? My mind does not entertain severity. It doesn't become still. It doesn't become fixed or hard. I'm still, I'm an old softy. I'm a pushover. They stole my wealth, they stole my peace, they stole my stuff, and they kicked me out, and I'm still thinking, hey, are, are they happy? Are those good thoughts or are those bad thoughts? They sacrificed, they have sacrificed a father's love and affection, affection for a master and a kinsman 
in their greed for wealth, and yet my mind joins them all in affection. Though knowing this, O oh great learned one, I fail to understand how my contemplations are disposed to love even characterless relations. Those thoughts have no character at all. They have no, they, they just they stole my peace. They stole the wealth of my realization. They stole my satchit ananda. They put me out in this world of action and interaction and I'm still thinking about them. Because of their actions, I heave a sigh and feel dejection and despair. But what can I do? My mind does not become hard, even for those who are devoid of love for me. They don't love me one bit. They thought more about the wealth of my realization than they did about me. Otherwise, they would have never stolen away my peace. But I love them. I am pure intuitive perception. I am infinite consciousness. I am going to allow them to perceive whatever is, is reflected in my mirror. They will see. I show. I am the mirror. They are the reflections. Whatever they show in the mirror, that fruit of their karma they're going to receive. Markande said, and then together, the two, pure intuitive perception, the businessman, and the very noble monarch, good thoughts, the king, they arrived in the circular sacrificial area in the presence of the great wise master. Uh, observing the proper customs and congenialities for learning, they sat down and engaged in conversation. Now, let's talk a minute about those customs and congenialities for learning. What kind of in attitude would you bring to a great wise master to sit at his or her fire and ask questions about God and godliness? You bring the attitude of the highest respect. And that means Shri, Shanti, Cha, in your raw mind, E in your heart, you're going to listen to what he or she says. You're going to listen to the guru with total equanimity and total peace, total objectivity that I am presenting an issue for deliberation in front of someone who knows and I really want to listen to the answer. I didn't come here to debate. I didn't come here to have you verify that I have the best opinion. I didn't come here to have you tell, tell everybody and praise me in front of everybody that I know the most and you know the least and I should be the guru and you should not. I came to learn with that peace. That's the first qualification of a true seeker. Not that I'm going to, I've come here to tell the guru how to run the ashram. No. I've come here to allow myself, afford myself, avail myself of the privilege to sit and see what an enlightened being or what a wise master would do or respond in response to my queries. Now, they observed the proper customs and congenialities. That's a little bit about the mindset that you want to go to. Now, what's the custom? Don't Go empty-handed. Don't. Your spiritual means giving more than we take. Don't go to the great wise master and say, okay, fill me up. <laughs> I came here to get whatever I could. Fill it up. No. Come and bring something that will be of value to a great wise master sitting in before the Howen Kun. Bring a flower or a bunch of flowers. Bring a piece of wood or a bundle of wood. Bring 
him some fruits or some sweets or something to feed the other devotees, to bring something as a token of your esteem, of your privilege, of your pleasure, your, your sense of, uh, of privilege that you get to come to such a great wise master and sit at his or her fire. Don't go empty handed. Always bring something to say, gee, I'm so happy to be here. And then when you come to do a, a, a great wise master, don't be afraid to bow down. And if you don't feel inspired to bow all the way down, well then bow a little bit. <laughs> Namaste. I come here to humble myself before you, to observe the custom and congenialities conducive to learning. I respect you. I demonstrate my respect. And it's not just I bend down and touch your knee or your thigh. Uh, that's that's it, it become a modern custom, and it sure doesn't have any reference to Sanatana Dharma. It's like, hey, I salute you, but you're not important enough for me to bow down, so slap a piece of thigh. <laughs> I, you know, when I was in college, we, we had a fraternity of slap a piece of thigh. <laughs> it is not appropriate in modern demonstrations of respect. The left hand is Shakti, the right hand is Shiva. With all the energy of my conscious being, I bow to the divinity which you represent to me from my heart. Namaste. And at least have that feeling, that bhava, that aura, that attitude of namaste. With all of my energy and all of my consciousness, I am demonstrating to you my humility, my sense of privilege, my sense of awe that I am allowed to come and sit at your fire and listen to your wisdom. Namaste. And then, don't just plop yourself down wherever you want to. Wait for the respected master, the great wise guru, the great wise master will of her own accord or his own accord invite you. Ihagach, ihatishta, have a seat. They will of their own accord invite you and show you an appropriate place to sit. I've had many people come up to the to, to visit our Havan Kun and they sat down and took up three asans in front of the fire. <laughs> yeah, aren't you privileged to be in my presence? Is exactly the attitude that they demonstrated. And the answer was no. I am not that privileged to be in your presence. Please sit back there. Wait until instructed to sit down and wait until invited to engage in discourse. You are going as an observer to observe what is, what is the Bob, what is the attitude, what is the, the, the illumination, what is the aura, what is the feeling of being in the presence, what's the inspiration I can get. It's not just about knowledge and facts. I'm not just, I can buy the book unless somebody wanted to steal the book. But somebody, I could just buy the book and get the facts. It's not just the facts. It's the bob with which I understand the facts. And then pretty soon, if I'm open and I'm silent inside, and I'm silent in my mind, and I'm silent in my heart, and the great wise master communicates, that's going to inure to my benefit. I'm going to find an immediate inspiration to change my life if it's really the great wise master or if I am really a disciple. If I'm not a disciple, I'll say that was an entertaining hour and, and I'll turn around and won't make any change in my life. But if I want to make myself into a disciple, there will be an immediate change in my behavior. I just get the inspiration. Something is different because of this relationship. So, the, 
observing the proper customs and congenialities for learning, they sat down and engaged in conversation. And the king said, and he's addressing the Muni, the great wise master, and he says, you who have united with the infinite self, look at the respect the disciple uses to discuss with his guru. I mean, disciples don't go to debate with the guru. Hey, look, Guruji, I know more than you do. I've been in this business for six months now, and, and I'm here to tell you the error of your ways. No. You who have united with the infinite self, I recognize your greatness. I recognize your attainment. I respect and appreciate your attainment. I wish to ask only one question of you, and please be pleased to speak on that. If you, if you deem appropriate, give me an answer to my question. My reflections are without control, and give much pain to my mind. I have great attachment to the kingdom and to every aspect of the status that has gone from me. But even with this knowledge in the matter of one who is ignorant, I still feel pain. Why is that, O oh great learned one? Now here, look, I recognize, you see, I, I, I recognize that I, my mind is out of control. I pray that it gets into control, but it doesn't listen to me. And every time it gets out of whack, out of kilter, it goes, it gives me pain. I mean, it's a pain to be here watching all these thoughts. I'm not enjoying it. Ah. And I know I have attachment to my, my stuff and my status and my position and my projections of who I should be and what I should become and how I should relate, how people should relate to me. I know this is all bogus. It's all my mind. It's not based in reality or fact whatsoever. I know there is no kingdom that's going to last forever. There's no thing that's not, that comes into existence that's not going to go out of existence. I, why, in the manner of one who is ignorant, do I feel pain? Why am I upset by this? I'm an intelligent being, Rishi. You are, you are the great knower of all. Please, you know God. Tell me how I can, why is it that I feel pain when I think about all of my attachments, about what was and what should be? And here this humble man, cheated and deceived by his wife and children and employees and cast out, even deserted by his own relations, he still maintains the greatest of affection for them. He's Samadhi. And all those thoughts came into his mind and they kicked Samadhi out of his mind. Just like the rest of us, he's out of his mind. And he's, he's de even deserted by his own relationships, he still maintains the greatest affection for them. Thus, both of us are feeling pain. Now, it's not just the pain that's a pain. But to add insult to injury, even though we see the defects in our contemplations, we know this is bogus. We know this is bakwash. We know this is improper, inappropriate. We, it's not real. It's just maya of attachment to people and relationships and things and relationships with the things. And here I am worried about my elephant. And I'm sitting in this beautiful ashram surrounded by devotees. And I'm thinking about the elephant. Even though we see the defects in our contemplations, nevertheless, our minds are drawn into attachment and egotism. I can see it. I don't doubt it for a minute. I am here. That's my ego. And I am thinking about my stuff. 
whether it's my physical stuff or my metaphysical stuff. I'm thinking about my attachments. And therefore, I am drawn into attachment and egotism, and I don't doubt it for a moment. What is it? Oh, exalted one, hey Rishi, hey Muni, oh Guruji. What is it that causes this ignorance? Even in the presence of our wisdom and understanding. Hey man, I've written 40 books in 10 languages about the subject, and I'm still, I know, I know fully well that this is wrong thinking, and still I'm thinking about my egotism and attachment. What is it that makes us do that? We know. We have wisdom. We have understanding. Well, why still? It's not enough. We all know fully well how to attain the highest realization. Every one of us. And we all feign ignorance. And we all, oh Guruji, tell me how to get self-realization. How to achieve the greatest wisdom. We all know it completely, immediately. There's no question, there's not the slightest doubt in the mind of any of us. And yet, we're still wandering around in egotism and attachment. With the answer is one sentence. Give up all our attachments. We know it. If I give up all my attachments, if we give up all our attachments, we will remain in samadhi for as long as we remain unattached. We will remain self-realized for all, for all eternity. We know it. And yet we're going around. Still, we are like fools without the capacity of discrimination, looking for any alternative so that we can keep some of our attachments, even while we pursue liberation from all attachments. <laughs> you can have all God, except don't take this one, please. <laughs> Just leave me this one. We know. There is not the slightest doubt in any of our minds. Just give up all your attachments and you'll be free. And yet we're still looking for a loophole in the, in the fine print of the contract. How can I just keep a few? <laughs> That's the issue. How do we give them all? Because all of us, we're sincere seekers. In fact, we're probably among the sincerest of the sincere seekers. And still, look at our lives. We are bound to this and bound to that. That's the question we have for you, great machine. How will we give them all? And the Rishi said, Oh, great light of luminous splendor, and I call you that, O oh king, because you are so intelligent that you at least ask the question. You've got enough smarts to ask the question. The rest of us are saying, okay, well, maybe we can negotiate, God. Huh? Oh, great light of luminous splendor, all that lives has knowledge of objects perceived by the senses. If you got a sense, you know what it is. There's nam and rup. As soon as there's a, you perceive rup, form, you ascribe a name to it. There's a relationship between the name and the form. Every, sensual, every being that has sensory perception has knowledge of the senses. You see it, and you know what it is. But the objects of the senses are perceived differently by all beings. Everybody sees through the purview of their own prejudice, of their own bias, of their own inclination. Everybody colors it a little differently. Remember the story of the chameleon sitting in the tree. Ah, and they, one, boy, one boy came and said, oh, it's a it's red animal. And the other one came and said, no, it isn't. It's blue. And then one said it was green. And one said it was purple. And then one said, you know what? He's a chameleon. And he becomes many, many colors to anyone. In the same way, some beings are unable to see in the day, like the owl, while others are unable to see in the night. 
and still others have the capacity to see equally well in the day and the night. And then there are the rest of us who can't see at all either in the day or in the night. We see forms, but we don't really see them. We don't intuitively see them. It is true that humans have a capacity of understanding, but not only humans, everyone's got attachments. This knowledge is common to all animals, whether beasts of the forest or birds of the air. All living beings possess this understanding just as human beings do. Everybody's got an attachment. Anybody who's got a stomach is attached to the food even as it goes through. And then, just as in human beings, the capacity of understanding exists in all animals. And this is a general principle that the understanding of the two is alike. Now look at those birds. Though they have knowledge, because of attachment, they are ignoring their own hunger and are busy putting food into the mouths of their children. Isn't that amazing? I mean, they're hungry themselves, and yet they take the food and they put it in the, in the mouths of their children, ignoring their own hunger. Would you call that attachment? I would. They're not putting it in my mouth. They're not putting it in every other mouth. They're putting it into a specific mouth. My child, that little chick. <laughs> Be but supreme among men. Humans are different because they are desirous of obtaining reciprocal assistance from their children in their need. Ah, so the birds put the food in the mouths of their children and, and let the children fly off. But human beings put the mouths in the food of their children and say, stick around. I want you to live life according to my definition. Please fulfill all of my goals. Do everything that I wasn't able to achieve. I, don't become a sadhu. Become somebody who's respected in this world. Become somebody important. I, I have some claim of right to you. I fed you and nourished you during your childhood. I want something back in return. They don't just listen, let their children fly off. They keep pulling them back and say, hey, come and visit your, your dear old pup. How observant he is to show that all animals and birds wish for their children to grow to independence and continue lives, their lives, according to their karma. While only humans desire to maintain a lifelong relationship and mutual dependence. And that's really something fascinating. All us humans, we want a lifelong relationship with our children and the relationship of mutual dependence. You will feel the need to come to see me. <laughs> humans cultivate bonds of attachment to a much greater extent than any other species. And can't you see that desire in their greed? This is a form of love. This is a form of greed. I need my children to acknowledge me in order to feel myself successful, important, acknowledged. And this is my love. This is my, uh, this is my greed. Actually, if I feel myself totally self-contained and self-respected, I won't need any external acknowledgement whatsoever. So therefore, there's some lack in my attainment, and I'm trying to get that confirmation, that affirmation from my children. People are 
are hurled into the whirlpool of attachment and the pit of delusion by the great measurement of consciousness. This is Maha Maya. They put, she puts us into this whirlpool of delusion where they, they as soon as we come out of the womb, they slap us on the behind and say, you're an individual. Be a somebody. Be, be important in this world. Be acknowledged in this world. Be, be a successful in the world. And then people will respect you. This great measurement of consciousness is the cause of the circumstance of all objects in the creation and of their relationships. Every object has a relationship to every ob other object. This is called sansar, the ocean of all. So we, this ocean of objects and relations, this sansar, is, is a, 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 a relationship between every object to every other object. For this, there is no need to wonder. The consciousness of the universe, the Supreme Lord, is put into the sleep of divine union by the great measurement. And therefore, the world is deluded by her, she, this supreme goddess, the great measurement of consciousness, attracts the perceiving capacity of all sensible beings with such force as to thrust them into the ignorance of egotistical attachment. Here she is, she's Mahamaya, the great measurement of consciousness. Now, see how she operates. Picture... Picture in your mind, you'll have to close your eyes to do this, picture in your mind's infinite consciousness with, without any other object. There is no duality. And you picture that darkness, that yoga nidra, the sleep of complete union where there is no duality. There's not a second one. Now, shine a light. Make a bindu, make one point of the manifested existence in that infinite field of darkness and suddenly our consciousness is attracted to that light, to that object. The universe is born from her, the perceivable world with all that moves and moves not. She thrusts them into the ignorance of egotistical attachment. And as soon as I see that there is a duality, there's two forms, and she has given birth to the second form, then I say, I am different from that. And here we have the delusion born of duality. And she has measured consciousness by the relationship between the two objects. That is, she is the great measurement of consciousness and in by she measures the contract, uh, consciousness and attracts the perceiving capacity. Try and move away from that one point of light. And wherever you go, you'll think in relationship to that light. Wherever you try to look, you'll perceive or think in relationship to that one point of light. So that great measurement of consciousness attracts the perceiving capacity with such force as to thrust us into the ignorance of egotistical attachment. I am different from the second. And the universe is born from her, the perceivable world with all that moves and moves not. And it is she who after satisfaction, bestows upon humans the blessings of liberation. And that's it. She gives birth to the duality. She is the duality. She blesses those who wish to be free from the duality. And if she's pleased with the sincerity of our devotion and the focus of our attention, then she withdraws her energy from the duality and gives it back to consciousness and we go back into infinite consciousness perceiving infinitely. It is she who is the ultimate knowledge, the cause of the liberation of consciousness, the eternal existence, the full, complete, 
supreme over all sovereigns, and she is the cause of the bondage of consciousness to objects and the relationships, the full and complete supreme over all sovereigns. Mahamaya, Yoga Nidra, Mahakali, Her name here is Mahamaya. Maha means great and Maya means limitation or measurement. The great measurement. It doesn't mean measurement in the sense of a ruler, like how far. It means measurement in the sense of a boundary. Every form is a limitation. It limits our consciousness. It divides our perception in space and distinguishes from the form from the back, from the front to the right or the left of the form. As soon as you have a form, any point in space is a definition. It's a limitation because there's a before and there's an after. There's a right side, there's a left. There's an above and a below. If there were no form, there would be unlimited, unqualified, unobstructive consciousness perceiving itself infinitely. So in the highest meaning of the goddess, uh, the Devi Atharvashisham that we studied uh, the other day, there are three measurements of consciousness. Ring. Three forms of maya or limitations. As the one in harmony with her own self, there is not a second. As soon as we put one dot or bindu on a plane in space, we have a relationship in front, behind, above, and below. In this way, she is the great limitation of consciousness. She measures consciousness by virtue of being a form, and then she creates division, a distinction which separates it from all other forms, and every form is a container of consciousness. And that form is Maya. The container is Maya, the limitation. The contents is consciousness. As soon as we get entrapped by that Maya, our supreme consciousness goes to sleep and we forget to look beyond the forms to see that the form is a container of consciousness. When we stop looking at the consciousness and look at the forms, our divine consciousness goes to sleep. And when she is pleased, she takes our attention away from the outside form and lets us look inside, and then she liberates consciousness. She liberates us from the bondage to form, to the measurement, to the expression, to the manifestation. She grants us freedom. She is the full and complete sovereign over all sovereigns. Let's pause for a moment and see if there are any questions that we can discuss tonight. Swamiji, question from Janitri from Maryland. Yes, namaste Janitri. Swamiji, is it a custom to directly give the fruits or flowers to the master or rather is it preferred to bring the gifts to the temple and arrange the fruits or flowers in the temple and not place them at the feet of the master? Janitri, every temple and every guru kul has its own procedures. So you'll have to observe what is the custom of that temple. And then in accordance with that custom. Now, generally, there is uh, somebody who's been in the temple before. And you could ask someone who looks like they know, what would be appropriate? If you don't find any guidance on the subject at all, come to the guru and offer those flowers. Don't put them at her feet. But offer those flowers and ask the guru, uh, can I put these in a vase for you? Or can I offer them on the altar for you? Or can I offer them just to you directly? Uh, if you put them on the floor, on the ground, at the feet, then they can't be used for puja. So then it's not an appropriate offering. 
you've just uh, you've made juta of your offering of purity. So it's not appropriate come down, bow down, put the uh, a bunch of flowers at the feet of the guru. That's not appropriate. Uh, what would be appropriate would be to offer them to the guru and hold them and say, can I organize these for you? Can I, so that they're useful to you, that you can use them in your worship. And then I get to watch you. What do you do with the flowers? I could do the same thing myself if I learned. If I put them on the floor and they become jutta, well, then you can't offer them. I've already offered them. Uh, the, it becomes a, a wasted effort. So look for the customs of the temple that you're visiting or the guru that you're visiting. And if you don't know, then ask somebody who looks like they may know. And if they don't know or you don't find anyone, then ask the guru yourself with all humility and all sense of privilege. Guruji, I brought these flowers for you as a token of my esteem. How can you use them best? What would be the best way for me to organize these so that they're useful to you? Uh, I don't assume that oh, if you put them on the floor at the feet of the guru, it, it, you've shown the greatest respect. Samaji, question from Devi from Atlanta. Namaste, Devi Ma. Namaste, Angel. My mind says nothing would suit me more than to give up all attachments. But in reality, there is family responsibility and all that comes with it. How does one with family let it all go? You don't. <laughs> no way. You don't. You don't let it go. Davy, what you do is you make it an offering to the goddess. Goddess, you gave me this family to care for. And now I am serving you by doing this puja. I have to take care of them because it's you. I don't want to put my burden back on you. What if I just threw my hands up in the air and walked away? Then it becomes your responsibility. What kind of a devotee am I? I don't give up the responsibility. I give up my attachment to it. It's your sansar. I'm just doing the best I can. I am the chokidar. I'm a cook and a cleaner and a bottle washer and I'm uh, the servant of God by taking care of these responsibilities that you gave me. If you can maintain that attitude, then you can free yourself. We can free ourselves from our attachments. The, the more that we get into the idea that I am serving God by doing this puja, this is the demonstration of my love for you. And this is the puja you gave me. And now I'm doing it. And I'm doing it cheerfully. And I'm doing it happily. And I never say, I say I love to do what I'm doing. I'm privileged to do what I'm doing. And then I get to serve you by doing what I'm doing. That's the way we can free ourselves from attachment. Actually, that Arnav Nandi from Bangalore. Yes. Uh, Namaste, Arnav. He's, he's asking a related question. Yes, How please. to live in the world as in not renouncing my work and my family and still be unattached? Arnav, you have two hands. With one of them, do the work of the world. And with the other, grab onto God and don't let go. Mother talks about being like the puckle much, the fish in the mud at the bottom of the pond. He's always in the mud, but he's never dirty. It, nothing sticks to him. In the same way, Arnab, we have to practice. We're doing the most efficient, objectively efficient using the optimum amount of resources, time. We're not wasting time. We're not wasting resources. We're not wasting money. We're not wasting energy. We're using the optimum proportions of everything to be the most efficient to accomplish the task. And then we're offering it to God. And that efficiency is a sadhu. 
Sadhu actually means efficient. Someone who does their karma with such efficiency that they don't have to go back and repeat it again. Every time we make a mistake, how many times we have to go back and clean up the mess we left behind? Whereas if we do it efficiently, we do it once and it's done. And we don't have to go back at all. And that's called sab. So, Arnab, we bless you. Be a sab. Samiji, Arnab says that you have answered his question, but sometimes my actions of detachment can displease my parents. In that situation, what to do? The king just said the same thing. <laughs> Do you know, Arnav, you, you, uh, the Mahamaya has thrust your parents into this whirlpool of Maya where they're looking for their fulfillment through your actions. And it's not always par possible if you are to fulfill your dharma. Not their dharma. You're to fulfill your dharma. So it, you're going to have to discriminate. Discriminate between what will bring me to the highest fulfillment and how can I organize my family so that they are comfortable and peaceful and empowered to, to strive for their fulfillment. Now their fulfillment doesn't really mean having me do everything they wanted, that they wanted to accomplish themselves. That is not actually their fulfillment. And even to this day, my family are aghast that I became a sadhu. <laughs> and it's 40 years! <laughs> and even to this day, they would rather me be the, a king or a businessman <laughs> rather than samadhi. So I had to find a way to harmonize my activities with their goals in life and what they wanted for themselves and what they wanted from me. And if I could find that solution, if I could define that essence, then I could become sadhu. I could be efficient at doing what I need to do to fulfill my goal, my dharma, my definition of perfection in this lifetime. And also empower them to continue to move on their paths as well. Arnab, I think those are some of the keys to the solution. Somebody, question from Marsha from Twain Heart, California. Namaste, Marsha Ma. At what age is one expected to begin reflecting on detachment? <laughs> as soon as possible. <laughs> the moment you wake up, the moment you hear about it, start. Angel came to us as a young girl, and she's still blessing our computers to this day. Uh, Sham came to us as a young man, and he still works uh, uh, engineering our audio systems. So, Marsha Ma, as soon as possible, some of us uh, heard about it in our young age and thought that that was a good idea, even to the chagrin of our families. Uh, and here we are some years later still doing it. Others heard about it later. As soon as you can, start organizing your life around the principles of Dharma and the definition of perfection and accomplishing your goals. So, a question from Usha from Canada. Namaste Usha Ma. Namaste Neil. Swamiji, could you please say a bit more about the symbol of the circular sacrifice, sacrificial area, round rather than square, like the Havan Kund? The whole idea of sacrifice, what birds are doing seems like sacrifice to me, or the law of reciprocal maintenance, whereas humans are attached and want something back. Isn't the whole manifested universe about sacrifice? It is when we realize. When we realize that it is about sacrifice, then we live at peace. Because we become spiritual. Yajna means, it comes from the root yuj, to unite. And the union 
is the union between the Atma and the Paramatma. It means the union between the, the Agnya Chakra fire, the fire that burns in the Agnya Chakra, and the fire that burns outside. These are forms of the Agnya. Now, in, in our Hauen Kun, it's not the Hauen Kun that's circular. But there's a circle that, uh, around the Hauen Kun in which all the devotees sit. And we have it in the foundation of our, uh, of our construction. So that we weren't able to do it on the floor, but we did it in the foundation of the st uh, structure. We drew a circle around our area, and now all the devotees sit within the circular area of the sacrifice because in the circle it's like a Lakshman Rekha. Uh, remember uh, 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 Ram went off in pursuit of the deer, the illusory deer, and uh, uh, then Robin conjured up his Maya and had Marich, his uncle, call, Lakshman, I've been shot by an arrow, come and help me. And Lakshman said, uh, that can't be Ram. And Sita said, wait, I knew that voice. I'm sure it was Ram. Lakshman, go and help your brother. Lakshman said, no, my brother ordered me to stay here and protect you. And Sita said, what good is it to protect me when my husband is out there in the forest shot by an arrow? And Lakshman said, Sita, it can't be Ram. He's the Lord of the universe. He's the Lord of the three worlds. No one can shoot Ram with an arrow. And Sita said, if you don't go, I'm going to go myself. And Lakshman said, Sita, get inside the cottage. <laughs> and Sita went inside the cottage and he took an arrow and he said the mantra and he drew a circle around the cottage. It's called the Lakshman Rekha. And do you know what? Not even Ravan could pass over that circle. No one had the capacity to pass over that circle. Because once you're inside the circle, if you're in the center of the yantra. Just like when we worship the yantra usha, we put the circle there, and you're protected by the energy of all creation. So that's with the, the reference to the circular area in which the sacrificial fire was burning. Uh, now, yes, the birds are making sacrifice. Obviously, they are making sacrifice. The humans, especially humans like Arnab circumstances, or many of us, uh, uh, other, the families are making demands on us that are contrary to our dharma, that are contrary to our intrinsic understanding. We understand, uh, many of us understand stand that to live the life of a Brahman and submerge ourselves in worship and study and prayer would be the highest goal of existence and yet even being born in Brahman families, people are asking us, our families are asking us, go out and be vaishyas, be, be business people, go out and earn and be res respected for how much wealth you have. We know it is contrary to our dharma. They know it is contrary to their dharma and yet they're abjuring us to please follow another path. So all of this has to be discerned and discriminated and understood. What are the limits of my responsibility to my family? Certainly I would love to provide them with transportation. But am I required to buy them a new Mercedes every year? Certainly I need to provide them with housing. But do they need a penthouse uh, uh, in the middle of the city? Or would it be nice to have a, a little house in the suburbs? What is the definition of my responsibility? Arnab, Sridi? So many of us, we have to decide. This is a definition we're going to have to make in accordance with my dharma. And if I can fulfill their basic needs and encourage them and give them the attention and acknowledgement and appreciation that they require, 
then I could pursue at the same time my ideal of perfection, what I came in this lifetime to accomplish. And I believe that will be of greater value. Om Sam Saraswati in the Maha. Namaste. Namaste. I think I got too much tonight. Do you have any more questions? A few. Well, let's go ahead. Let's go. Let's keep going. Go ahead, Mama. Um, would you explain? I'm not understanding this. Um, Yoga Nidra, Sleep of Divine Union. What what state is that, and in, in how does it fit in with where we're trying to go? This is the sleep. It's. It could be called. The sleep of Nirvikalpa Samadhi. So there's just... There's one. just... One. One. Okay. Total union. Total union. Vishnu is in Yoga Nidra. And now these two thoughts are going to come. Too much and too little. And they're going to say to the creative capacity, don't sit there in the lotus of the navel of supreme consciousness. Fight with us. And Brahma says, hey, I don't want to fight. I'm an old man. I didn't come here. I'm just sitting here contemplating creativity. And too much and too little are going to attack and Brahma says, Vishnu, wake up. And Vishnu doesn't hear him because he's in Samadhi. So Brahma prays to Yoganidra, who is, she's very nice. She's described, Vishweshwarin Jagadatri Stiti Sandhara Karanim, Nidran Bhagavatim Vishnu. Atulam Tejasaprabhu. Come on, Brahma. Where did you say that? For the purpose of awakening the eyes of consciousness. Wake up, Vishnu. The revered one of brilliant light. That's Brahma. Extolled the ruler of the universe. That's Yoga Nidra. The creator of the perceivable world. She creates preserves and transforms. She's all three of them. The cause of evolution and devolution, the goddess of sleep, the unequaled energy of consciousness. So she is the form of Chandi, the form of infinite Shakti, the form of infinite energy, the form of the goddess of sleep. And that's what she means. And then uh, she, she says to Brahma, okay, I like your song. What do you want? And Brahma says, hey, wake up Vishnu. He's the fighter. I'm not a fighter. I'm an old man. Uh, wake up Vishnu and let him fight with these two demons, too much and too little, and put them in balance. Put them out. Get them away from me so I can continue my creation. And Yoga Nidra says, okay. And she withdrew her Shakti from the consciousness. And he woke up. And he saw, oh, there's too much and there's too little. And they are trying to stifle my creativity. So he fought with them. And the story has some fun twists and turns and we'll get to it maybe tomorrow night. <laughs> In our next session, hopefully. Are there other questions? Samji, there's a question from James Budnick. Hi, James. Namaste. He says, uh, did not Ramakrishna suggest that we should identify ourselves as a devotee or child of God and not so much as merging into the non-dual state? How does this correlate to Maya and separate self and form? Oh, James, you know you're absolutely right. It's, there are five postures of a yogi. Uh, there are five relationships that comes into union. Uh, I want to be a devotee of God. Uh, that's uh, uh, 
that's the, the, the attitude of, of Hanuman, I, I, the, the devotee, the pure devotee. Or I want to be a servant of God like Bharat or Lakshman. Or I want to be the child of God like Ram uh, I, I, uh, was to Koshalya. Or I want to be the mother of God like Yashoda was to Krishna. Or I want to be in union with God. There won't be any division. There won't be any distinction. There won't be any discrimination. Aham Brahmashmi. Shiva Aham. And these are the five attitudes that we take. So we start off by becoming a child of God. Hey, God's going to take care of us. I've got a right to make noise. I'm going to, I'm your kid. I can, I'm going to make noise and tell you pay attention to me, mother. Just like every other kid does. And then we become a servant of God. How can I serve you, mom? Yeah, I'm going to put these feet and these flowers on your altar and I'm going to chant these mantras and wave this incense and cook your food and make, serve, the, share the prasad. And then we become a parent of God. And then, I, I, here we are, I, 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 I'm nurturing all the other devotees just the way that you're nurturing me. And then we become a devotee of God. Look at, this is the fruit of my devotion. 